I can still remember my first time. It was uh, 1994, and I was 27 years old. That was the first time I ever clicked on a banner ad on the Internet. But actually, it's not true. See, the thing is, I don't remember most of the advertising I see on the Internet, let alone do I click on much. And I bet that that's probably the same thing for a lot of you. And I think that's a problem. It's a problem because if we want to keep the Internet full of valuable, interesting, entertaining, and fun stuff to do, we need to find a way for people to get paid enough for them to make a living from it. And today, other than Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, and a few of the newbies that are out there like Netflix or Uber uh, or, uh, uh, or Airbnb, you know, apart from those folks, for the most part, the business model of the Internet is broken. Does anybody know what that is? That's the first banner ad that was ever on the Internet. It was a, a, a website called Hotwired. Now it's called Wired Magazine. And it was in uh, October of 1994. That's 21 years ago. And uh, uh, along with uh, uh, that ad, they ran a bunch of others, and a few from an agency called Organic Online, which I joined a couple years after that. So somehow, some of this is my fault. <laughs> and uh, uh, so kind of on behalf of <laughs> the Internet, <laughs> The advertising agencies, the programmatic marketers, those guys with the pop-ups and all that stuff, I'd like to say we're sorry. <laughs> um, you know, the thing is, it's, it's pretty bad, right? But the thing, we didn't really plan it this way. It was an experiment. 21 years ago, we just tried to figure something out. We thought, hey, let's give this a try. But somehow it stuck. It became the thing that we need to do. It's the way we fund the Internet today, right? The, the point is, there's about the same uh, percentage, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's about the same thing, right? Getting hit by lightning and clicking on a banner. What was the last time you purposefully did this thing? Well, these are facts, right? It's fact. That is, that is the world where we're in. This is it. So I grew up in Rochester, in upstate New York. That's where Kodak is from. You might have heard of them. They're that little photography company uh, that had the patents for digital photography and sat on them for about 20 years and are currently being uh, uh, disrupted out of business. It's a sad tale, but I kind of learned disruption firsthand that way, so I guess so how, somehow for me it's a, it's a good thing. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting to look at a couple of other companies to see if the past can teach us something about the present and the future. Oh, this is Wikipedia in 1874. <laughs> All right, look how far it's come from, from way back then to today. This is the iPad in 1955. <laughs> and as a little side note, when people tell you that being digital is antisocial because you're all head down, refer them to this thing. <laughs> it's human behavior. It has nothing to do with digital technology. It's just the way we, way we are, right? <laughs> this is WhatsApp in 1944. <laughs> And if they were eating the notes, it would be Snapchat. <laughs> That's my best joke of the day. <laughs> this is the New York Times in 1996 when I was working there. This is the advertising that was on the, the, the New York Times in that time, right? Two little banner ads. This is the New York Times in, 1990, in, in uh, 2014. It could be 1994. It may as well be. That's 2014. That's the advertising that was on the New York Times at that time. One big banner ad. Kind of reminds you of this, right? <laughs> it's where we are. It's where we are. It's terrifying to me. It's hilarious, but it's terrifying. There are 200 million people a month using an ad blocker today, worldwide. 200 million. It's, it's not a, uh, uh, there's nothing subtle about this number. It's 200 million people going, no, thank you. I don't want this stuff. How many, how many people here? Use an ad blocker. Yeah, you're not shy. Hey, that's my point. This is my point. You don't want it. It's growing at 41% a year. In Austria, 25% of the quality media websites, Standard, Presse, etc., Courier, where I had worked, 
Um, 25%, a quarter of our traffic, has ad blockers installed. On more technical websites or youth websites, that number climbs over 30, 35, 40%. That's 40% of your business that just disappears. In the advertising and marketing uh, business, we like to, you know, we kind of look at ad blocker akin to the same way of the rules of Fight Club. The first rule of uh, ad blocker is you do not talk about ad blocker. <laughs> the second rule of uh, uh, ad blocker is you do not talk about ad blocker. But I mean, it's pretty easy, right? Why, why not? Why wouldn't you? If the more people learn about this stuff, the the more they want to use it, because what they get in return is normally crap. Right, so this is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Try to pronounce that five times fast. Um, I studied him in graduate school. He's a TED speaker. You should look him up, uh, just not now. Uh, he gave a, a great talk on, on flow and happiness. And this idea of flow is, is a state that you get in when you're in the zone, where you're feeling like you know, you, that things are going your way. And the internet, you, you can feel that way when you're involved in something that you like, when you're watching a video that you love, or reading an article, or doing something funny. And advertising today gets in your way. Pop-up ads, unskippable video ads, these things that block the flow is counterintuitive to the idea of having a memorable and pleasurable experience online. And that's a fundamental problem with the business that they're in. Now, people hate this stuff, and they hate the fact that advertising costs them money. If you're on mobile with a fixed contract, it costs you money to download people's advertisements. And it also costs you time, two things that we're kind of hard-pressed for these days. In Germany and Austria, uh, we have a heightened sense of personal data and data protection, and that gets in the way and promotes this idea of why one should use an ad blocker. I mean, the, these are the only cookies, uh, third-party cookies especially, that I think people really want as opposed to being tracked across the internet from 60,000 sources that they have no idea who's doing it. And, and mobile. <laughs> mobile will be huge, right? It's 60% it's, it's, it's of the traffic in the United States. 60-40 desktop, 60-40 uh, mobile to desktop. In Europe and in uh, Austria, it's about 50-50 and it's growing. And at the moment, I can't think of a single decent uh, business model, other than some of what Facebook is doing with their little advertising, but normal banner ads on mobile suck, right? When you click on them, normally it's an accident, right? How many of you have accidentally clicked on a mobile ad with your thumb, <laughs> right? You're like, shit, back, 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 <laughs> right? We have invented an accidental business model, and it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. People talk about the digital revolution, I think it's a, an apocalypse. I think we've created an environment that's unsustainable and something needs to change. And so, it got me thinking. If they turn the music up, you might even hear it. What if there was no advertising? Wouldn't it, Wouldn't it be, be nice? Be turn that up a little, it'd be nice. So, you're outdoors, it doesn't get in your way anymore. You look right through it. It doesn't get in the way. You're out for a stroll, you don't get bombarded, the spaces are empty, the architecture shines through and things are just fine. White spaces, your days are clear, everything is just fine. Times Square transforms, right? it becomes beautiful. The New York Times, an easy place to hang out, no more advertising bothering you, the, Gar the Washington Post, the same thing. Websites that have more advertising than content suddenly become usable again. And YouTube, without pre-rolls or without advertising, wouldn't that be nice? Right, wouldn't that be great? Somebody sent me this link to Die Presse here in Austria, and I couldn't figure out where the content was. I was the chief digital officer at Courier until September 1st of this year. I resigned. Uh, to try to be a little bit better and do this with you to you today. Um, but even where I was working, this is the home page of that website. Now, where are we? What, what have we become? Armin Wolf would you know, <laughs> do the same thing. I'm sure he thinks the same way. But if we get rid of it, if we get rid of it all, what really happens? This is Snowfall from the New York Times. Have any of you seen it? It won the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago. It's a brilliant piece of work. It told the story of a, a skiing accident, a tragedy actually, but in a way that no one had ever really seen before. Videos, interviews, infographics, a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. 
This is the NSA decoded on The Guardian. Have any of you seen this? It was uh, such an approachable piece of work. Again, videos, infographics, interviews with people, uh, text, images, uh, an incredible amount of work went into making an incredibly complex story something very approachable. And for me, it was, it was a, a fantastic thing. I, I, it got me closer to this issue. It brought me an understanding. What would happen if the advertising is gone? What happens to the social networks that we all rely on, most of whom are ad-funded today? What happens? What happens to the fun stuff? What happens to the, the cats and the, 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 the night shows that we like? What happens to even the fun stuff if we can't find a way of paying for it, if we can't fund the Internet in a way that makes enough money for people who do it, but that doesn't piss you all off too much? So what if Austria could help solve that problem? It got me thinking. In uh, uh, somewhere around 400 BC, Plato said, those who tell the stories rule society. And it took a couple thousand years, but in the 21st century, we seem to have figured that out here in Austria. Case in point, Felix Baumgartner. Right. I had the pleasure of working for Red Bull for a few years of my life, and I discovered that in Austria, there was a company that figured out that telling stories was much more fun than doing advertising. It works. Millions of people enjoyed this story told by a brand. Or Chris Davenport, an, an off-piste skier who I worked with, does a 16-part video series about what it's like to be in Alaska or in South America and be on pistes. He dumped me out of a helicopter once in order to take a couple of pictures and do an interview. Uh, it's a, an another talk and another time. Or even at Courier, we worked on telling stories across platforms in a different way that didn't do advertising but that sto put storytelling and content in the middle of, of the argument. So, there's ways to do it, you just have to look. But what can you do? What if, what if you could help fix this, right? What happens if the next time you went to Wikipedia and saw a Jimmy Wales mug on the, on, on the, on the internet and, and Jimmy was asking you for five euros, what would happen if you gave Wikipedia five euros next time? They run fun drives every year. They need it. Our kids use it, I use it, you all probably use it on a daily basis. What if we gave them five euros? What if Maria Popova on uh, brain pickings, for example? Anybody know brain pickings here? Another one to jot down, right? Great, great stuff. It's, it's, it's inspiring. It's daily. It's a lot of work. And it's funded by donations. You know, people are reaching out and saying, if you love what I do, please help us uh, do it. And I think that's a, a much better way. It's one of the better ways of, of doing this. Or the standard, for example, that has this idea of fair use, where you can get rid of the ads if you're willing to pay for stuff. And if you're not willing to pay for stuff, they say, please let us show you the ads. It's kind of a fair arrangement, certainly better than some of the stuff that's going on today. And in your corporate lives, if any of you have the ability, I like to kind of look at it like the iceberg. 10% is the part that you see. It's the tip of the iceberg. What would happen if... 10% of your budgets, if you found a way of clawing that back and telling stories that meant something to people instead of putting advertising in front of them and being more authentic and saying things that people would want to hear as opposed to just being posters in some places. Something to think about. It's, uh, you know, doctors, scientists, an, an astronaut, um, uh, an, an, an over 90-year-old woman who I think everyone wants to be their grandmother. Um, I, I, I am standing on, and a geek, <laughs> you know, I, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants today. And uh, as the son of another Syrian immigrant, uh, it's been an honor, a pleasure, and a bit of a dream to be with you here today. Thank you.